In this video, we're going to study biology. We're going to start off by looking at the characteristics of life. In other words, what are the criteria that make something living? Uh, we're going to take a look at what biology is. Um, and then after we do that, we'll be able to classify um, things as being either living or non-living. So one very important um, skill when studying science and especially biology is being able to understand the definition of different words. Biology has a lot of terminology. There's a lot of words in biology. Um, and one common way to um, avoid having to memorize too much um, and to just understand words more easily is to dissect the word. So biology over here has two parts to its word, bio and the logic part. Okay, so biology. Um, the bio part means living. The logic part means study of. So when we study biology, we are studying life. Biology is the study of living things. So again, if you can start to understand what different parts of words mean, when you see these parts again, you'll be able to um, guess, make a reasonable guess as to what that word might mean, even without having seen its definition before. Biology, study, uh, the study of living things or life. Um, so... Now we're going to go and take a look at, well, what are living things? On the next few slides, there'll be a series of objects. Um, and I want you to classify those objects as either being living or non-living. So for example, if you take a look at this rock here, do you think it's living or non-living? If you take a look at this plant here, is it living or non-living? So maybe create a table kind of like this over here where you might place these items um, based on what you think they are. Now, uh, the fancy scientific word for living is biotic, bio, meaning life. And this, the fancy scientific word for non-living is abiotic. So uh, when you add a to a word, um, that a means without. So this means without bio, without life. So non-living. So you can classify substances or objects on the slides as being biotic or abiotic. Tried for these ones here, place them in your table, and tried for these ones here, place them in your table. Now we're going to compare your answers to um, the answers the answers on the slide here. So all these ones here are considered living or biotic, and all these ones here are considered abiotic, non-living. So in your mind, you had this idea of what living is, what makes something living. And in your mind, you had this idea that, well, these things don't have those characteristics that make something living, so they're non-living. And so today we're gonna to take a look at what are those characteristics? Maybe you didn't quite know how to list them all, but you had some feeling, some idea based on your life experience. There's no one definition of what life is, and there's no and not every scientist agree on the following characteristics we're going to learn. Um, but it, these are common characteristics that scientists do use to classify something as living or non-living. There are seven characteristics of life that we're going to be discussing. There's metabolism, homeostasis and control, reproduction, growth and development, evolution and adaptation, and then being made of cells. So the idea is that if something contains or has all of these characteristics of life, yes, 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 then it's considered living. But if something is missing something, missing one of these characteristics, then it is not considered living. So we're going to go over each of the characteristics of life um, in this video. Uh, what you'll also see on each slide is, or many of the slides for the characteristics of life, there'll be a an additional video to watch. Uh, it's just a YouTube video with some other interesting facts about um, the characteristic of life described on the slide. Um, you don't have to memorize everything from here, but you could watch it and uh, write down one important or one, one interesting fact or idea that you learned from that video as well. You can add that to your notes. So the first characteristic of life is metabolism. In other words, living things need to use energy in order to survive. Um, so we have to obtain um, materials and the energy from our environment. 
Um, so for example, plants and animals, they need to do that. Uh, we are animals. Uh, and so what we do is we go and we eat. When we eat, we digest food. We break it down into these smaller molecules like glucose or sugar. Then we send the sugar to our um, cells and in there a special process called cellular respiration happens where the sugar is broken and then the energy is taken out of it so we could use it to do all our bodily functions. Um, plants also need energy, but they don't go eat, right? You don't see a plant uh, going to the fridge to make a sandwich. Um, the plant has to make its own um, energy rich molecules. So molecules full of like its own sugars. And the way it does that is by doing the process called photosynthesis, where it uses basically sun, carbon dioxide and water to make sugars. And then once the sugars are made, um, then it can send the sugars to the cells to do cellular respiration, to break the sugar open and to take the energy to do all of its functions. So very similar idea. We all living things need um, energy to survive. Um, and um, the energy is pretty much, it's going to come from some sort of, of energy rich molecule. For animals, we eat uh, to get the energy rich molecules, but for plants, they have to uh, produce those molecules using photosynthesis. And the, at the end though, both plants and animals are going to send those, those sugars and energy rich molecules to cells to do cellular respiration, to break them open and to do work yeah, and to do their bodily functions. So you can kind of see that over here. Here we have an animal consuming um, some food. Uh, it's going to digest that food to get some energy rich molecules like sugars or carbohydrates, we sometimes call them. Um, and then we can uh, essentially break these molecules down um, to um, release energy uh, that we can use to survive. And so it's this energy over here that we use as five. We'll see more details on this later on. Uh, the next characteristic of life is homeostasis and control. So living things need to be able, need to, be able to um, regulate um, uh, their bodily functions and regulate their uh, bodily characteristics. Um, so what does that mean? So for example, um, when we talk about homeostasis, that means that we need to be able to maintain some stable conditions in our body. So for example, our body temperature. Our body temperature, um, it varies from person to person, but generally you're going to be around um, 36, 37 degrees. And regardless of what the temperature is around you, that body temperature is going to stay the same. You have mechanisms inside your body that allow you to maintain that stable body temperature. Uh, blood sugar, for example. Blood sugar, the amount of sugar in your blood, um, regardless of what you eat, you have mechanisms and reactions and parts in your body that help you to maintain a stable blood sugar. If your body temperature or blood sugar change too much from where they should be, um, you can get very sick where you need interventions. And if you don't get those interventions, it's possible for the organism to die, unfortunately. Um, so, um, and also maintaining your, uh, your, your, um, your hydration, maintaining your, you just saw chemistry, your, uh, blood pH, those are other things that we, our bodies um, are constantly fighting to do. So living things are able to maintain stable conditions um, and different living things do this in different ways. Humans have a variety of different uh, mechanisms in their body that allow them to regulate those different conditions. And that's called homeostasis, maintaining stable internal conditions, even though your environments change. Um, and if you want more details on homeostasis, you can watch the quick video here, um, but just know some general examples of, of um, what homeostasis is and be able to provide examples from our own, from your own body um, in terms of how you maintain homeostasis. The third characteristic of life that, are, that living things need is um, reproduction. So living things are able to make more of themselves, they're able to reproduce. There's sort of two main ways that uh, reproduction can happen. Um, some organisms can do both. Some organisms can only do one. Um, there's something called asexual reproduction, where a, uh, a single parent will actually give rise to um, its own offspring, so it'll make its own kids by itself. So here you have a parent cell, um, and it starts to split into two, and it made offspring. It made its kids over here. Um, and the thing is, these are genetically identical to this parent. They're clones. They're basically, they have the same exact DNA because this is just essentially just a photocopy, photocopy of this organism. Um, now, there's also something called sexual reproduction, where uh, two parents will combine their genetic information to make kids or offspring that are genetically different from each other. So it gives more variety, diversity there. So you can kind of see that happening over here. Um, 
we have two parents over here coming together and then eventually they exchange DNA or combine DNA and we give rise to, um, to offspring that are genetically different from each other. Here we can see a plant being grown. Um, the way it's grown is you cut a piece off from this original parent plant here. You plant this piece into its own separate pot here and then this grows into its own um, plant which is identical to the plant that you cut it from. Um, so there's asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. We're going to learn about asexual reproduction this year in um, grade 10 science. Sexual reproduction is what uh, humans do, but your cells do asexual reproduction as well. Though, though keep in mind, as humans, um, you're never going to create your own child just by yourself. You don't, you're not going to split into two um, individual kids. Um, sexual reproduction is required for that. Uh, the fourth characteristic is growth and development. Um, so living things are able to increase the si their own size, size of their structures. They're able to specialize, so they become um, more specific at the jobs they do, and they develop as well. Um, and just a simple way to look at that is here you have a plant um, starting off from a seed, and it becomes a full-grown plant. Here we have um, a child starting off as a child here, and it becomes an adult and develops over time. Um, so grows, develops, changes. Um, here we see the life cycle um, of a butterfly uh, from caterpillar to cocoon to butterfly uh, to make more babies. Um, but basically what you see here is just examples of growth and development. As this thing gets bigger, it also develops. It gets more specialized structures that do more specific jobs and living things are able to do that. Uh, responsiveness is the fifth characteristic of life. All living things are able to respond to their environment in some way, shape, or form. Um, and that's something as simple as if you touch a hot stove, um, you're going to respond by removing your hand from that hot stove. Um, so signals are sent to your spinal cord, your brain, um, which basically say like, ouch, that's hot, and tells your muscles to move the hand away so that you don't uh, injure yourself even more. Um, and other things that you wouldn't consider can do this, like plants. Plants do, do something similar where, um, as you can see here, there's a light source. And this plant seems to have grown towards that light source because plants will need light to survive. Um, and that's actually a special um, uh, skill that plants have or characteristic called phototropism. Um, photo meaning um, light. So the plants grow in the direction of light. So living things are able to respond to their environment um, and to changes in their environment. Uh, characteristic six is evolve and adapt. This relates more to populations instead of one individual. Um, so here's an example of what that would look like. Uh, we'll start by looking at giraffes. So let's. this is a little hypothetical example here. At one point in time, uh, giraffes had, there was a mix in the population. Some giraffes had short necks, some giraffes had long necks. Um, and uh, what you'll notice is that uh, the trees start to grow really tall. And so over time in that population, the short giraffes could not reach the food on the trees. Um, so the short giraffes would not be able to reproduce anymore because they could not survive. So they would basically die off. And over time, there were fewer and fewer short giraffes. But the long neck giraffes, um, they could reach the food. And uh, over time, they could reproduce and survive. And there's more and more of them in their population. Um, and eventually, you don't see any more short neck giraffes because they're all kind of wiped out. They couldn't pass on their genes, but you only see long neck giraffes. And so this shows you that populations of living things, so many living things, um, populations can change over time based on their environment. Um, and so this is actually an example of evolution. So evolution doesn't mean the individual transforms into something like you would see in Pokemon, but it's more so that the populations change over time based on pressures in their environment. Um, and that's something you learn more in grade 11, but just understand that living things, their populations can change over time. And sometimes it doesn't happen um, very frequently. Sometimes it takes many, 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 many years, but over the years, we have records that that happens. And one of the most important things that we're gonna see that, that everybody can basically agree on is that all living things are made up of cells. Um, so the cell is the smallest and most basic living unit. It's the smallest living thing. Okay. Um, and that's what we're going to start studying in grade 10 biology. We're going to start studying the cell and its structures. Um, some organisms are unicellular organisms. 
they're made of only one cell. For example, this organism here is called a paramecium and it's, it doesn't exist as many cells. It just exists as one single cell, one cell. Some organisms are considered multicellular and multi meaning many. Um, that means that the organism is made up of many cells. Um, so many animals, plants, fungi, like a mushroom, um, though many of those are um, multicellular organisms. And so here you can see two types of cells. This is an animal cell, um, which is basically the type of cell that animals are made up of. And this is a plant cell, which is a type of cell that a plant is made up of. And we're going to learn about the differences and similarities between animals and plant cells. These are only two of many types of cells that exist. There's fungal cells, for example, algae cells, prokaryotes. And if you don't know what those are, that's okay. We'll get to learn um, about a few more of those in grade 10 as well. So um, what do we see? Well, we saw that these are the seven characteristics of life. We can apply these seven characteristics to determine if something is living or not. So for example, a human. Does a human need energy to survive? Does it have the metabolism? It does. Does a human control its... Um, its conditions that it maintain stable internal conditions. Um, and we saw that it does. It can maintain um, body temperature, for example. Um, so it has that characteristic. Do Can humans reproduce if they wanted to? Yes, they could. Um, can humans grow and develop? Well, they do. We know that. You know that. You're a living example of that. Um, have humans evolved and can they adapt? And, and they are. They are evolving. They have evolved in the past um, and they do adapt to um, uh, changing environments over the long term. Um, and are humans made of cells? Well, yes, if you zoom in and take a look at, at our tissues uh, with microscopes, you'll see that we're actually made up of uh, many, 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 many cells. So we have all these characteristic, characteristics of life, so we're considered living. A rock, okay? Does a rock have a metabolism? Does it need energy to survive? Well, no, we know that doesn't. It doesn't need that. Um, homeostasis and control, does it maintain stable internal um, conditions? Well, not quite. It doesn't. Um, do rocks reproduce? Well, some of you might get creative and say, well, if I take a rock, break it in half, well, then it reproduced. Okay, fine. We could give it that. But in reality, that's not true, true reproduction. But even if you said yes to that because you were trying to be creative with your answer, um, it's, we still already have no for, um, for these two characteristics, characteristics. So already my rock is not living. Um, growth and development, again, you might have been creative by thinking, well, you can add more pieces onto your rock and it grows, but that's not really the rock growing itself. Um, so it, it doesn't really grow. Um, but if you did try to be creative with your um, answer and said that um, it does grow because it, it accumulates more mineralization over time, um, and you said it changes into different types of rock over time based on different condition, you could have put yes. But again, because we already said no to all these other things here, the rock is still considered non-living. Um, does it evolve and adapt? You could have been, again, trying to be creative with your answer, but populations of rocks don't really exist and they don't really evolve. Um, so no. Um, and are they made of cells? If you zoom into a rock, you'll see they're not made up of those individual cells. Um, so because they're not made up of cells, especially we know that they're not living things. A plant, does it need energy to survive? Yes, it does. Does it maintain stable internal conditions? It does. Um, do plants reproduce? They do. You know that when you plant seeds, um, those seeds are the result of reproduction. Um, growth and development. You've probably seen plants grow, trees grow, grass grow. Um, evolution and adaptation. Yes, plants have evolved and do evolve. Um, and are they made up of cells? Yes, you can zoom into the tissues of plants and see that they are made up of cells as well. Bacteria. Bacteria that live in your intestines, bacteria that cause disease. Um, they actually have all of the characteristics of life. Um, and bacteria themselves, they are cells. They're actually, for the most part, unicellular organisms made up of individual cells. Um, but bacteria are living things. A virus. So this is where it's a bit tricky. And you're going to do a bit of a reading and watch a video, this one here, um, to, to classify viruses later on. Um, but what's interesting about viruses is that they do have some characteristics of life, but not all of them. Um, but they interact so frequently with our cells and um, they have many similarities of living things that scientists often argue about whether viruses should be classified as living or not. For the most part, they're considered non-living, 
um, because you'll notice that they don't have metabolism. They don't do that homeostasis. Uh, they don't really grow and develop. Uh, they don't. They do adapt and evolve, though. That's interesting. So we've noticed pot. We've noticed viruses have adapted and evolved. Um, they're not made up of cells. And then in terms of reproduction, well, we kind of say they reproduce, but they don't really. They can't reproduce on their own. They need to go and hijack your cells, like take over your cells and use your cell parts to help themselves reproduce. So even though they have some of the characteristics of life, potentially, technically it doesn't really reproduce, um, the virus is still really considered non-living because of all these other things that it's missing. But it was, a, and still is, an area of debate um, in certain circles of biology. Um, but to see more details, watch this video and there'll be a little passage that you'll read later on in your handout to, um, to learn more about that. So we just saw the seven characteristics of life. We saw what biology is. We saw the um, uh, examples of each of those characteristics of life. Uh, and this is sort of how we're going to approach biology in grade 10. Uh, we're going to start off by studying the cell. And then we're going to see that cells are uh, they can they come together to make what's called tissues, which are just a group of cells that do special functions for us. We're going to study tissues. Then we're going to go and study organs, which are a group of tissues that work together. Um, and organs are things like your stomach, your heart, your liver, your pancreas. Then all those organs, they come together to make organ systems. For example, your stomach, your intestines, esophagus, so on and so forth, make your digestive system or your lungs and other organs make up your respiratory system. So we'll study organ systems, what their functions are, and then all those organ systems come together to make you the actual organism. So your digestive system, respiratory system, circulatory system, reproductive system, uh, all the different systems in your body, about 11 of them, um, make up you, the entire organism. And that's going to be our focus when we study biology. Um, we're going to do that for animals and a, little, and a little bit for plants as well. Uh, and understand that the first living part that, that, that really starts is a cell, okay? So we are basically leaving chemistry, okay? So chemistry was atoms, um, molecules, compounds. The atoms are made from those protons, electrons, neutrons. All that stuff was really non-living. Um, so cells, they're living. Um, they're made up of all those things, but those things before the cell are not considered living. You're only living once you've actually become that cell.